So let's dive in and take a look at our areas of support for families and peers in recovery. And essentially they're in four areas. We have family support groups, we have connection recovery, there's also faith net, and then we have help via phone and email. So here to explain our family support groups is one of the pillars of the NAMI Hawaii chapter. This is a guy you definitely want to know, and he's much beloved by our membership, Mr. Mike Durant. So um, we we have been we have a family support group that we started in the year two thousand. In it started in Manoa, and we had, it actually was called at one time the Journey of Hope, and uh, uh, that was a training. But that was something that uh, was done, and then Nami adopted the Journey of Hope training and it's essentially the very similar uh, ideas but the support groups you find is really kind of the entry way into NAMI when you're dealing with a family member or or loved one of some sort as a as a support person for someone with a serious mental illness we we do tend to concentrate on the serious persistent mental illness people uh, bipolar and schizophrenia. And uh, the support groups have a, a pretty um, good agenda that we follow. We, we start with a welcome, uh, then we read the principles and the rules, and then we have opening stories. And the opening stories are uh, one to two minutes, but um, we find that hard to really enforce. And uh, the idea with the opening story is that they'll, they'll tell you story and then we'll come back to you again. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to keep that story short when people have uh, a story they want to continue telling. Uh, but in any case, after after we get everyone set a chance to give their um, opening story, then we go back and do a group discussion, usually looking for somebody who you would start on the person who has the most difficulties going they call hot button type issues. And uh, some of the rules are we start and stop on time uh, and uh, absolute confidentiality. We, uh, you know, just not, you're not to go out and tell. You, you could give a general description of, you know, a woman had a son or something like that, but you would never give names or, or, or more specific information uh, that might tip off who they're talking about. Uh, so the people who come, some of them have been to the family the family training class, but many of them have not. And often that's what will lead them on to the family to family training class. So it's, it's it, 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 and another kind of interesting thing we find about the support groups is we, we don't, it, it's very rare that somebody comes and says, oh, I have a son or daughter who just was diagnosed. I, I took him to the doctor and, and here's my situation. And, and, and then that's actually quite rare. What you usually get is that I've been dealing with this for two three years and I don't know where to turn. I, I, I don't know where to get help. And that's exactly because, and that actually was our case too. Uh, you you think oh we can we can have the doctors the you know the, there's there's the doctors know what they're doing and and uh, we know how to you know this is an illness and needs treatment and as you get going you first off find out that services are rather disjointed and then uh, you find that you have you're dealing with someone who doesn't want treatment so the frustration of that and so that's where we find people really coming to the support group and. Support groups will typically have uh, some people who come regularly. Right? Uh, and, and then you also have people who uh, will uh, just uh, come once or twice and, and leave. The regulars are really important because they help with the discussion. They, they also know, uh, and they've kind of learned about what things can, what we can do and can't do. Uh, the support groups typically uh, about five to ten. You start getting more than about twelve people, and uh, it, it it starts to get uh, uh, hard to get around. We when, sometimes when we have that many people, we barely finish the the opening stories, and that's uh, 
and you know you're you've run out of time. So uh, that's pretty much the wrap up, and unless uh, I think I've missed anything. Um, so are all the support groups done by Zoom right now, Mike? What was that again? So, are all the support groups done via Zoom or are uh, any in person? Yes, yes, right now. We, it was interesting. We had this one uh, room that we started with and uh, our first, it was in Manoa Senior, Manoa Garden Housing. And they told us that uh, we could no longer use the room after 20 years. And on um, that, the last uh, meeting we had there was the last in-person meeting we had, the next meeting we had to have by Zoom. And uh, so uh, it's, it's been doing Zoom for uh, about well over a year now. So um, I, in a lot of ways, I like the Zoom meetings because um, you're not having to travel there, carry stuff, <laughs> but I think the in-person meetings are better. Yeah. And we have quite a few support groups, right? Um, across the island so they can check the website for the times when these groups are meeting right right yeah check the check the the, um, the best best source is the website shows the times and the, the contact information um, and they are all zoom these days um, and that, that probably will continue for a few more months at least um, but yes get go to the website and then um, most of us, especially once you've come to a support group, are available to uh, a answer some questions if you were to call or email to us. Yeah, I just think the support groups are such an important part of what NAMI does because we work with many professionals, but it's nice to actually work with some other parents that are journey partners with you and maybe a couple that have been a few steps ahead of you that can you know, serve as guide and give you resources and insights. Um, so thank you for your service in that area, Mike. Okay, I might, might add too that, you know, they are restricted to, to just uh, family and friends and um, not for consumers uh, and also not for, for professionals. Uh, it's just that sometimes you have a professional in there and it can be a little intimidating. And, and if you have a consumer in there, the same problem is you start to mention something in and it uh, becomes uncomfortable uh, about dealing, having somebody who actually has the illness there. Great, okay, thank you. So if you have any questions for Mike, feel free to put them in chat. We'll address them at the end. Um, but right now we're gonna move on to our next program, which is called Connection Recovery. And this will be presented by Anisa Weissman. Anisa is the NAMI Hawaii Program Director and we all know her as the beloved manager of the NAMI Hawaii Walk, which is um, one of the, the prize events of NAMI every year. So uh, Anissa, would you please talk about Connection Recovery? Yeah, just real quick, our walk is scheduled for October 10th, so I hope to see you guys then. Um, and also, so I'll go over the Connection Recovery. I've been running the Connection Recovery Support Group for a little over a year now. Um, we... It, I want to go back to what Mike was saying, how we don't allow professionals in there and we don't allow family members in there. And that's really due to the safe space, creating that safe space with people with shared experiences. Because as soon as you put a professional or a family member in there, it's no longer a safe space to share those experiences. Um, so um, we do a check-in where everybody sh shows like how, how they're doing and what's going on. Um, and then later we go into some group wisdom where we share coping skills and just um, how to get through the pandemic right now and everything else that's going on. So um, it's been really nice to have them online for a lot of people because they um, didn't have the time to go to a support group before and a lot of them didn't have access to a vehicle. So having it online has been really good for a lot of them. And um, uh, there's a lot of people that are grateful. So um, we'd love to see your face. Um, if you're struggling right now and having a hard time, please, please come show up. Um, we're all right there with you. Um, and yeah, I think that's. that's so when do you do your connection recovery zooms? So I do mine on uh, the first Wednesday of the month at, at noon. Um, and then we have another one that 
meet, I always get this wrong. Uh, I think it's the, the second Tuesday of the month at 6.30. It's tonight at 6.30. Um, yeah. Great. Okay, so check the website for those Zoom links. I guess they're there. And uh, we'll move on to the next NAMI Hawaii program, which is FaithNet. And this discussion is going to be led by the very kind, caring, and compassionate Kathy Reed. <laughs> Kathy, will you tell us about FaithNet? You have to unmute. There you go. Oh, wow. That was a lot to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am... Um, I'm honored to be a part of FaithNet. Uh, Kumi had asked me to help her uh, last year. And then um, I said, sure, I'll help. And then she said, okay, I'll, uh, can you take over? So uh, I've, been, I've been blessed to um, have a um, FaithNet group. FaithNet is, this FaithNet group is more of a, uh, it's a Christian group. And it, it's um, the most, most of the people that have come in have been um, their, their caretakers, their family members um, have illness, mental illness. Um, we've had a few um, that have, you know, have had uh, different mental illnesses, but not real severe, maybe like anxiety and depression, especially during this COVID time. And um, we, we always open it up in prayer and uh, we, we believe and ask God to help us through a lot of our uh, trying times. And um, we have seen God move. So, but there are uh, other opportunities. If there's other, other faiths that want to start a group, they're welcome to do that. Um, I was gonna call my son, Christian. So maybe he's not available, but I was going to have you meet him because he has um, recently turned um, to his faith and, and to God. And uh, we just see him on a daily basis um, really help, help my son. Uh, we have some real ups and downs, but um, life's not perfect. But uh, yeah, we've just um, been able to find God to, to help us through all of this. So, but um, anyways. And we, when do you meet, Kathy? Yeah, we meet on um, uh, every, uh, every second Friday uh, at 7 p.m. And if you would like to, if you're interested in joining us, we do it by Zoom. And uh, I send out an email to everybody. So if you're interested, you can send an email to Anissa or Kumi and, um, and they can direct you and I can add them onto to the list. And let me just put my, my two cents in about, so um, for our peer support group, we just have an email list. And if you want to be put on the email list and send us an email and let us know, um, because that's how you're going to get the Zoom link. Is And even if there's a kind of a lot of people on that list, because I think they're just keeping it in their back pocket for when they're having a really hard time and struggling, that it's, it's ready to go for them. So if you know somebody that is struggling, then tell them to email us or give us their email or whatever, and we can get them on the list. Yes. Maybe what we could do in chat is put your emails or put the emails that you want people to use to oh, okay. you know, your programs in the chat. That's a good idea. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I guess my son got busy. He was uh, going to come in and just say hi. <laughs> but oh, well, we can bring him back later yeah. if he comes in. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's and then finally, yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah, Kathy. Okay. And then finally, we'll do that at the end. Uh, NAMI Hawaii provides um, support via email and phone. And here to talk about that is our executive director extraordinaire, Ms. Kumi McDonald. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. So the phone and email support is usually the first step for people getting help. They usually find us on the internet and then they contact us. 
Because of COVID, we are usually open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the weekdays. We are not open on holidays or the weekends, but if you email me, I do check my emails, even on a holiday, even on a Saturday. So please, if there's anything urgent, you can email us. How do you find the email and phone number? Go to our website, namihawaii.org, namihawaii.org. Or you can put it in Google, just put a NAMI. It, we're the first thing that'll pop up mental health. We're the first to pop up and you can find us that way. But I think a lot of families um, usually call us. They don't know what to do. They're often like what Mike said. They're usually like, I've tried everything. I'm frustrated. I don't know what the next step is. And then I found you on Google or a friend referred me. And then we then... The path for each family is so unique. I mean, it really is like a spider web. Like you can go any direction and there's so many ways of, uh, to finding that. So, so, so each case will be a little bit different. And what we try to do is try to navigate them, kind of encourage them, try this path, try that path. But we are by no means mental health professionals. And we clearly state that, that I'm not giving you any advice. We're not giving... Um, Oftentimes people say, I need a psychiatrist. I need a psychologist. We do not refer people to lawyers, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, or doctors, but we can give hints that we might say, well, we don't recommend them, but I know a couple of families who've tried this or that, this or that, or connect to a support group, connect to the classes and connect with family members and hear who they've used and if it worked for them. And so there's all these different options and that's kind of how it starts. And we plug them into our programs and that's really where they're gonna get the help. Did I answer your questions? <laughs> I mean, we'll get to the questions later, right? Yeah, maybe in the chat function, you could put the phone number for the local office, right? The phone number for the, there's a 24 hour phone number too, right? That NAMI National hosts. The NAMI national phone line is not 24 hours right now because of COVID, but okay. um, it is, they do have a, 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 long, a longer help warm line hours. And the other thing too about warm line is that I'm not the only one giving the advice. Sometimes I'll, they will say, oh, I have a, a family member who has bipolar disorder and I'll be like, oh, Anissa has experience with that. So I may ask Anissa to call or somebody else might say, oh, I need help in Hilo and I might refer them to Kathy Hamez or I have, I often re refer people that if they say, well, I have a church background, then I might send them to Kathy Reed or, or, you know, depending on who might be able to help. So it's, um, it's not just me answering all your questions. We have a huge team. Uh, within the NAMI community. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. So um, that covers the area of support. We're going to move on now to the area of education. And we have a family and friends training program, which is a four hour program. And we also have a family and friends education program. And that's an eight week program. And coming to us all the way from Hawaii Island is a woman who can get things done, uh, Kathy Hamas, and she is going to describe both of these programs to you. Uh, aloha and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as Debbie explained, she asked me to share with you today about how NAMI and its affiliates are providing family education programs to caregivers of loved ones living with mental health conditions during the stressful time of the COVID pandemic. As I'm sure all of you who are caregiving for loved ones know we are or are becoming accustomed to dealing with crises. Luckily, we have some wonderful options for you in our toolkit. Today, I'm going to share information about two of these options and how they fit into NAMI's core role of educating families. NAMI National develops the curriculum for our education programs and presentations. NAMI Hawaii, the sponsor of this event today, trains the leaders in the delivery of the education programs and presentations. Then the NAMI affiliate volunteer leaders deliver the programs in their geographic regions, basically the four major counties in Hawaii. So NAMI and education initiatives use the peer education approach that is the heart of NAMI programs. The peer education approach is based on the lived experience of volunteer teachers 
and presenters who are family members of loved ones living with mental health conditions. NAMI is committed to offering current information, a variety of solutions, and understanding and empathy to all participants in our education programs and presentations. Our goal is to build a compassionate learning community where you are not alone and we strengthen each other. A 2016 study entitled On Pins and Needles, Caregivers of Adults with Mental Illness reported 8.4 million Americans care for an adult with emotional or mental health issues. As you might expect, due to the typical earlier onset of mental health conditions compared to most other medical conditions, caregivers of adults with mental health conditions provide care for longer. In this study, an average of 8.7 years compared to an average of four years for all caregivers of adults. This makes education programs for families all the more important. NAMI strategic goals for education programs are that one, people get help early. And two, people get the best possible care. And three, people get diverted from criminal justice system involvement. We envision a world where all people affected by mental illness live healthy, fulfilling lives supported by a community that cares. The first program I want to share about with you today is NAMI Family and Friends. The curriculum was developed in 2018 and the class is open to the public. Participants are not required to share information. The presenters model sharing their family story about their journey with their loved one living with mental illness. Participants learn about warning signs of mental health conditions, mental health diagnoses, mental health treatments, effective communication strategies, crisis preparation, coping techniques and empathy, the importance of self-care, recovery, and NAMI and community resources. Participants have the opportunity to meet other people in similar situations and gain community support. This reinforces the slogan that NAMI has, reminding us, you are not alone. All this is done in only four hours. So this program is suited to people who are very busy and cannot attend a longer education program. It is also suitable for people who want a short or introductory review of the material covered in the curriculum. The second program I want to share about with you today is the NAMI Family to Family Education Program. The curriculum has been revised in 2020 and is offered in eight sessions of two and a half to three hours each. The target audience are families, significant others, and friends caregiving for people with mental health conditions. The curriculum includes presentations, discussions, and interactive exercises. The NAMI Family to Family Education Program has been designated by SAMHSA, that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, as an evidence-based program. Research has shown that participants report significant improvement as a result of taking the program in one, their understanding of mental health conditions, two, their coping and problem solving skills, and three, their feeling empowered to become advocates for their family members. Participants in the Family to Family program learn how to solve problems and communicate effectively, how to take care of yourself and manage your stress, how to support your loved ones with compassion, how to find and use local supports and services, up-to-date information on mental health conditions, how mental health conditions affect the brain, how to handle crisis, about current treatments and therapies, and about the impact of mental health conditions on the family and their loved ones. I'd also like to mention NAMI's belief system and principles. These are, first, you are the expert, the best judge of what works in your own family. We encourage you to trust your own instincts and take whatever you find helpful in our education programs. Two, you don't need to know everything. You need to be able to find what you need. Three, you cannot know what no one has told you. 
four, mental health conditions are biological like any other physical illness. Five, mental health conditions share universal characteristics. So we focus on symptoms and challenges rather than specific diagnoses. Many conditions have similar symptoms and challenges for families and their loved ones. During the COVID pandemic, these programs are offered via Zoom. Our next offering of the NAMI Family and Friends for our presentation is on Saturdays, March 13th and 20th, 2021, from 10 a.m. to noon. Our next offering of the NAMI Family to Family Education Program is on Saturdays, April 10th to May 29th, 2021, from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, a total of 24 hours. If you'd like any more information or to register, please email info at namihawaii.org or call 808-591-1297. Thank you for this opportunity to share about NAMI Hawaii's Family Education Program initiatives. Please enjoy the rest of this event. Thank you for that very comprehensive report, Kathy. That was excellent. And I love when you said you don't need to know everything, you just need to know how to find the answers. Uh, you know, um, because this is a journey, right? And so I, I think it was really powerful. Um, I also just wanted to clarify that even though the family to family education program is eight weeks, it's only once a week for three hours, right? So you're not doing it <laughs> uh, five days a week for eight weeks. Um, so that's, that's really great and exciting that these programs are coming around very, again, very soon that people can enroll in. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to go next to talk about our state conference, which is also right around the, direct, the, the corner. And I got a very big response when I introduced Kumi McDonald last time, lots of people clapping and smiling. And so we're going to bring her back up to talk about the upcoming state conference. So I'm back. Um, the conference is something that we've been doing annually for the last six years. And we try to do a topic that is very relevant to our community. But this year, we're going to do something a little bit different because we're all zoomed out. Like we want connection, right? That's why today's meeting, Debbie, so wise to let us interact and see your faces and make us feel like we, we are your friends. We know who you are. We want to get to know you more. And that's what our, our uh, conference will be like. It will be very interactive. It won't just be a sit down lecture for three hours. We're all zoomed out. We don't wanna hear another lecture, but what we want is we wanna do things. We wanna interact, we wanna try things. So our topic this year will be um, community resiliency for Hawaii. How do we as a community find resiliency through the pandemic, through the stresses that we are experiencing, either as a family member, as an individual in recovery, or even as a, a, a friend or a neighbor, or just the stress of being locked up all these months, right? And so some of the breakout sessions will be on um, chair yoga, or Anissa's gonna um, walk us through how to do a vision board, like casting a vision for your next year. What can our recovery look like? and she's going to share toolkits. We're going to have um, Kathy Hamas again kind of share on the classes and the support groups and how that helps you. Today she kind of shared a little bit about what it is, but when you go to the breakout session for the conference, you're going to actually get to participate. And you're going to practice a mini session so you kind of feel like, oh, this is how it feels to be supported, right? There'll be other breakouts such as chair yoga, how to find meaning through our trials and so many other great topics. So you can join us. It's absolutely free. And you can go to our website, namihawaii.org to register. Um, let's see. Is that it? Yep. Okay. What was the point on that again? The date for the conference? Yes, it'll be on March 22nd, Monday, March 22nd from 9 to 1230. March 22nd, um, 9 to 1230, register at namihawaii.org. And then the other thing that you wanted me to talk about is workshops. So we will also, after the conference, as we see the need for various um, learnings, 
various means of support. We, we will continue our little workshops and we have them at various times out of the year. And previous uh, years, we've had conferences on how to communicate with someone who's going through a crisis, how to, um, let's see, we've done workshops on, um, Anissa, help me. <laughs> I just blanked out. <laughs> well, we've done all these wonderful workshops um, on Our meditation. Music therapy, meditation, okay. nutrition. Yes. And some of them are presented by our wonderful board members. Um, we've had music therapy on there and art therapy. And oh, we're going to also have art therapy at our conference. So you get to actually do some, you know, skills and learning how to figure out how you're feeling by drawing. And you don't need to have any art skills at all. So yeah, join us for our conference and upcoming workshops. Again, if you want to be on our email list, please email me at info at namihawaii.org and I will put you on our email list for upcoming classes like what Kathy shared about our upcoming classes or any workshops, any new things that are happening, you will be notified. Um, most of you are, are, are on our email list because that's how you found us. But if let's say a friend introduced you today to this event, let us know if you wanna be on our email list. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Kumi. And um, I did want to point out um, in the chat, Mike Durant mentioned that his support group is actually meeting tonight at 6 p.m. So if you wanted to go to his family support group meeting, you should email him at gmikedurant at icloud.com. Um, you'll find that in the chat and he can send you the Zoom link. Um, okay, then- the Also, final... wait, one more thing though, um, to piggyback on Mike, um, the other connection recovery support group will meet tonight as well. So if you're interested in that, um, go to our website for more information. Okay, great. Um, and then the last area in education is the member and friends event, which is what you're participating on today. And we typically have these quarterly um, and usually with just one speaker, but we just felt like today we wanted to give you a broader overview um, of all of our services, but the next program will be in June and we'll probably just have one speaker at that program. So um, that goes through the conclusion of our content. Um, I just feel free to put any questions you have in chat so or, yeah. I have two questions that were emailed to us um, and I guess they're just kind of general questions. So whoever, if there are any, like maybe Mike might wanna answer it or, or Kathy, um, we'll see what happens. Um, so the first one says, what technique can you recommend to encourage our son to seek help from a private case manager? You know, um, I can address part of that. I think the first question before that might've, um, explained a little bit more about the context of it because there were two questions and the first question before that was I believe um it if, says if yeah. we see a psychiatrist with ongoing treatment for the past eight years what factors should we consider to decide in seeking further help for a private case manager and secondly with COVID in mind so usually when I talk to people family members I tell them to contact their insurance company Usually their insurance company will offer case management and um, sometimes they contract out. So if, let's say if you have Medicaid, they might contract out to care um, um, Ohana or you know wherever the insurance company is. But if you have private insurance like HMSA, then they have Beacon Health, which is uh, the mental health portion of HMSA and they will provide case management. So it's always good to have case management from the beginning. Um, and then if, how do you encourage someone to get help in case management? Again, you got to take our classes because our classes are where you're going to learn how to communicate, how to understand and empathize with the person and try to get them help. So it's, it's not a quick answer, but I would say take our classes, read our books, um, get involved, and you'll learn how to communicate with your loved one. I don't know if Mike or Kathy Palmez or Kathy Reed, any of you have any comments? Uh, 
Um, my son has, um, I, I'm not sure if I completely heard the whole question, but um, my son has a case manager and um, she has been so helpful. She just calls him every once in a while, like, like once a week almost. And, and, um, or once every two weeks and asks how he's doing and um, helps us look for resources. She talks to me a lot and then she'll text both of us instead of just him. Um, so that if he doesn't answer, I'll answer. Um, reminds us of his doctor's appointment, um, looks for other resources for him. Um, yeah, he, she's she's been very helpful and um, I think he's under care Hawaii. I'm not I'm not even exactly sure he's been with her for so long. So I don't, yeah, I don't know if that answered the uh, a question, but I do think case managers are very helpful. They kind of walk alongside with the caretaker. Kathy, did you have some contribution? Um, I, I did want to, uh, you know, my son does have a, a case manager too. But frankly, probably my husband and I consider ourselves really his case manager. I mean, it takes a village. Uh, but today I did get a very important call from his case manager hooking me up to a resource that I've asked about for a while. And uh, so I'm very thrilled right today. Uh, you know, we we'll really appreciate what she's doing. And uh, he's learning how he's going to have to deal with other people when we're no longer around. And that's an important thing. Another thing that I would suggest that people also look out for, which I haven't paid as much attention to, but I'm seeing it's getting more and more important is trying to get um, a, a peer specialist or a peer support person to, to work with your loved one. That shared experience that we use so much in NAMI, you know, the, um, the peer approach for just, it's great for family members to speak to another family member, but for someone who has the illness, who's maybe not, you know, feeling too connected with any system, it helps if they see someone who's walked the walk before them. So I encourage families to consider looking for that resource as well. Yeah, and, and Kathy, uh, when I took your class, you had some excellent tips about communicating with people with mental illness, you know, that were new to me. And I'm a salesperson, so I think I can communicate okay. But uh, <laughs> you had some new insights, so I do recommend your class. Well, they're not really my insights. You know, there are a lot of insights that other people have taught me about. And I mean, I, I think it's, for me, what was important was to learn about the mistakes that I were making, which were a lot of common mistakes, and then practicing how to um, change the way you speak. You know, uh, you know as a parent, I think it, we fall into a lot of traps of... Um, being too directive, uh, barrages of questions, and we really need to think about what it's like for the person hearing what we're saying, whether they're well enough to listen to us, and whether uh, you know it's a good time. So it's really quite an extensive thing and very helpful to change, I found for myself anyway, to change the way I was speaking to our son. And I've been doing this for 24 years, and I'm still working really hard at it, uh, you know, not to do things the way I used to. Uh, and I slip up often. So you have to be kind to yourself. And, uh, you know, there, there are some real experts like Dr. Amador, if you're dealing with anosognosia, those are really great tips. Uh, using I statements is something that we teach in the class instead of you statements and also the reflective listening so that you're addressing not the content of what someone's saying to you, which is something that, especially parents, I'm afraid we're, we tend to do that. Like we're very results oriented, get into treatment, find a job, you know, uh, you know, break up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or something like that. Uh, being, focusing on this is probably the most useful one for me, focusing on the emotions behind what they're telling you, even if they're just speaking word salad because they're really ill and try to connect with their feelings and not with 
necessarily the content of what they're saying. And these are techniques developed and uh, pro promoted by Dr. Amador in his Leap Institute. So there's a lots of stuff on YouTube, really good uh, videos of him teaching even uh, medical professionals how to talk to patients to get them to take their medication. It's very eye-opening. Encourage everybody to check it out on YouTube. Great. Um, I've got a question here. If anyone wants to answer or knows the answer, is there such a thing as substance abuse without mental illness? Anyone have any insight on that? I feel like that needs to be addressed by a professional. I would say the argument right now is that substance use disorder is a mental illness, but I don't know, there's two sides. I mean, there's still a big group of professionals who still believe that substance use can be in of itself separate from a mental illness. And there are um, co-occurring disorders where people have substance use plus an additional mental illness such as maybe schizophrenia or depression. And because of depression, because of anxiety, they're taking substance use to self-medicate. But it's a very controversial topic. I don't know if there's some professional online today with us that can answer that. I wouldn't really call myself a professional on that, Kumi, although I have been employed doing uh, substance use assessments. Um, you, you know, uh, I, I just want to echo what you guys have said already, because I think that, you know, that's really very true. But from the point of view of a loved one, uh, you know, a family member looking for help for their loved one with this, um, of course, yes, there are people who only have substance use disorders, which are also classified as mental health disorders by the DSM. So, um, you know, some people do only have substance use disorders. And that's really, those are the people that a lot of treatment is oriented towards. And in our experience, in our family, dealing it with our loved ones, substance abuse uh, or use, it's not really cool to call it substance abuse anymore. We're supposed to be calling it substance <laughs> use. So we're not being so judgmental. So I just stand corrected with that language. But, um, you know, for them to be, um, to be self-medicating is something that we see a lot with our family members who have mental illness. It's a way, a very, very common coping mechanism, often for trauma, the symptoms that they're experiencing. They're trying to find some way of feeling better. And so it's very important not, you know, not to be as I was there's calling it abuse, judgmental, and realize that whatever it is, if it's a standalone substance use problem, or if it's combined also with mental illness, it is a health problem that we need to treat, not through the criminal justice system and the courts and so on, but we need to treat that as a medical illness. That's my particular view. But as Kumi said, a lot of people you'll bump into the old system and substance abuse treatment, it's its own silo and they really have a much more punitive approach to getting well this is my personal opinion, uh, not necessarily Nami's opinion. And uh, it, it's quite difficult navigating that system as well as the mental health system, which although it has a lot of areas for improvement, generally is not nearly as punitive with people. You know, um, for example, my son was in a substance abuse treatment inpatient for seven months and they actually had to find him mental health help outside the substance abuse treatment center because um, as well as their day program, because they could see that he needed more than what they had available. They were very good on detox and things like that. They had hospitalization with that. They did an excellent job of that. But as far as the ongoing kind of care for mental health, um, that really, they could see it wasn't really addressing what his needs are. So you have to be very careful when you're looking for that kind of help for your loved one. So Kathy, um, there's a question here on substance use uh, disorder. Um, would someone who's got that benefit from your family and friends 
training or your family and friends education program. Okay, would, you want me to read the question? Well, uh, the question is would, it's a, it's would they benefit from that if they're dealing with a substance uh, use disorder? Would they benefit from the- Your family, uh, your trainings. Um, you know, I would say if they only have substance abuse, I, I consider it, you know, personally, like I said, it's, a, it's another mental health problem. Um, and you can see that by the fact that we have the SAMHSA, the federal government agency combined substance use and mental health together. And uh, so a lot of the techniques are very similar. Okay. Can I share a little? Um, when, uh, I do want to share a little bit about my own history. When I was in high school, it was peer pressure that got me into drugs. Um, and of course I was, you know, you get into your teenage years and you're trying to separate from your parents, right? And be your own person. And you can either be influenced in a good way or I happened to be with friends that started smoking marijuana and they said, oh, you've got to try this. It's just, you know, you feel so good and you feel so peaceful. And it took me about a year because I said, no, I don't need, I, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, because it, that was quite some time ago. It's not as prevalent, you know, it wasn't as prevalent then as it is now. But I didn't have a mental, mental illness issue. So I think sometimes people, uh, young people are peer pressured into it. And I, I know that this is NAMI and, and we're dealing with uh, the mental illness side and the, and the substance abuse. It, was, it wasn't until after my son had traumatic brain injury and I think out of that developed a mental illness and then went into substance abuse because he was trying to self-medicate. But um, I think, you know, there's, there's a, a difference. There are kids that are being coerced from their friends, uh, the peer pressure, and then they get into drugs and they, you know, it always feels good at the beginning. And then once it just, you know, gets that hook in you, then you want to try something else, something else, unless you're smart enough to say, you know, that's it. I don't need any of this. It's, it's damaging. So that's, you know, that's kind of where I, I believe that there, you know, there are reasons for some people with mental illness that have developed, you know, depression or bipolar, they don't know what to do with it. And, and then somebody introduces them to drugs because most of it is what street drugs, you know, they find it on the streets and, um, uh, yeah. Entertainment or just, you know, kind of like, yeah. Okay, well, we are actually over time now, but I, I let it go a little longer because I felt like some of the sharing is exactly what we're doing in NAMI, you know, it's just sharing and helping each other. So um, I hope that you will connect with our website for more information on all of our services and Hope to see you at our support groups and at our conference. And um, until next time, Malama Pono, take care. <laughs>